All right. I take it we are ready to go, Christina? We are good to go. Good to go. I got the green light. Um, a song that Andre 3000 was on. So there you go, uh, TJ. I don't even know if we're going to edit this part out because I want people to know that we have folks who are coming to navigate the new normal, professing that Biggie is better than Andre 3000. Do not worry, people. We will kick him out before we get started. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome a diversity of thought, though. So, uh, and that actually kind of ties into what we're going to be talking about. So, um, I'm Dion Gordon, Tech Birmingham. You know the team. Uh, just want to say thank you all for making time uh, to join us here for our Navigating the New Normal uh, web series. Uh, many of you all are familiar with how we got to this point. COVID happened, threw everything off, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were still meeting you all where you were at and providing resources and, and tools and tips uh, just as we navigate this new normal. And uh, a lot has happened recently um, that has, um, uh, we'll, we'll just say it has brought to the forefront how we have to appreciate so much more. Um, and, and, and I'm talking, of course, uh, about George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, that movement. What does all of this mean? This is a new normal that we're operating in as well, not just in addition to the global pandemic. Uh, and so that's uh, started to promote conversations around uh, diversity and inclusion, of course. What does that look like? Uh, systemic racism, um, uh, marginalized communities, how do we bring them into the fold? So this will be touching on a lot. I am really, really looking forward to uh, diving into this. And we have a wonderful, wonderful brother and friend of mine uh, who is going to be uh, sharing some uh, thoughts and insights. But uh, before we do get into that, uh, I do want to, again, recognize you all for, for taking time out of your day. Uh, of course, um, our, our friends over at Link, uh, at Regions, uh, for helping us to put things like this on. Uh, and as always, we will be uploading the video uh, to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash tech. Beham, um, if you are not a member, make sure you are, techbirmingham.com. We would be happy to walk you through that process. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christina for a couple of seconds to give us some housekeeping items and we'll get right into it. Great, thank you. Um, so just as usual, um, we have enabled the Q&A feature. So if you have questions for Anthony and Dion, please go ahead and throw them in the Q&A or you're welcome to do that in the chat. Um, and that's really all the housekeeping today that I've got. So I'm going to turn off my camera and let you take it away, Dion. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so I mentioned that I have a, uh, a, a brother and a friend who's going to be joining us. Um, I really cannot say enough great things about this individual. You all, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with him or have, uh, have heard his name, Dr. Anthony C. Hood. Put some respect on it. Uh, he is the uh, Director of Civic Engagement, uh, Civic Innovation um, at UAB uh, under the President's uh, Office. Uh, he's also a professor at UAB of Entrepreneurship and Strategic Management, I believe, uh, but he does so much more in the community. He's really uh, one of the greatest faces and, and, and representatives of Birmingham that uh, this city could ask for. Uh, and so he has been gracious enough with his time and busy schedule to um, talk with us about uh, effective DNI. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, um, we're 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 in a new world, um, for lack of a better way to put it. And so uh, there's a lot that uh, has taken place, um, especially uh, when you look at some of the companies that have made announcements and statements about um, their efforts and, and, and their pledges to uh, combat racism, uh, inequalities. What does that look like? Um, of course, Apple came out with a $100 million commitment. Uh, Netflix has committed to spend or redirect $100 million uh, to banks that support Black causes, and, um, uh, and they've even spent some of that with Black-owned banks. Uh, Airbnb, Uber, the list goes on. A lot of these companies, uh, large and small, are making announcements, uh, but it goes beyond that. Like, what next? What do we do? Uh, so again, a lot of questions, um, and uh, Dr. Anthony Hood has been uh, gracious to just uh, kind of bring some of his expertise and his insights and thoughts to this discussion. So I'm really looking forward to 
uh, unpacking all of this and, and examining what that means on a personal as well as a uh, executive and company level. Uh, and also just what it means for Birmingham, because I think uh, there are some intersection there, given our unique role in the civil and human rights movement. And so um, I, I think it is important for us to ask ourselves, um, what is our unique role uh, in this city uh, as we start to figure out what that next normal looks like? So uh, with that said, um, I will turn it over to you, my friend, um, if there is anything that you would like to offer up or anything that uh, I might have left out and, and we'll get into the uh, chat. Um. I just want to start with a roll tide. Um, <laughs> what, what, was that te technical difficulties? I'm sorry. <laughs> go, I, go ahead, bro. It's, it's, I walked into that one. <laughs> roll tide and the gold blazers. Uh, but uh, hey, I mean, I really appreciate you inviting me to come on and spend a little time with you and just kind of, you know, have a conversation and unpack some of these issues. I, I will say up front, just as a disclaimer, uh, I don't feel like I'm in no means an expert. Uh, on all these issues. I think if, you know, if, if everybody had the answers, we wouldn't be in the place that we're in right now. So I think we're in a place of learning, of uh, mutual awareness, hopefully mutual respect, but I hopefully, hopefully, you know, our community, when I say our community, not only just the Birmingham community, but just in the United States, hopefully we really have an awakening right now. We have a sense of urgency that we can't kick the can down the road anymore, that we really have to say now is the time we really have to be serious we really need to make some commitments to really untangle um, a lot of the issues related to systemic oppression uh, institutional racism and bias and things like that that have really been holding us back as a society but particularly in our business communities um, I know you and I are we love Birmingham you know we we both probably are looked at as ambassadors for our community um, and I think in those roles, we tend to look very optimistically about where we are as a community and where we're headed as a community. Uh, but I think in reality, we have to really be honest about where we are. Right now. And we really are not in a good place. Uh, when you look at our just our level of inequality uh, in our business community, when we look at inequality in tech, when we look at who's actually getting funded, who's starting companies, who's getting access to capital, we are not in a good place. And if we don't make some really hard decisions right now, I think in the next year or two, I don't know where Birmingham is gonna be 20 years from now. That may not even be a Birmingham. And I know that sounds like a, you know, a, a hyperbolic statement, um, but I think that's the kind of sense of urgency that we need to look at this. I mean, when we look at the number of uh, corporate headquarters that we had here 20 years ago, when we look at, uh, the, just the overall population that we have when we look at uh, employment and compared to where we are right now, I mean, in a lot of ways, we're in a downward slope. And in some ways, it feels like we're that, that frog in the boiling pot of water. And so it's like a slow burn. And because of it, you don't even realize how much trouble that you're in. And then you're like, what does that smell? <laughs> it smells like frog legs right here. I'm hungry. <laughs> then you look up and it's too late. Um, and so I, I, I think, and I'm, you know, it's very unfortunate the murders of George Floyd, as well as Ahmaud Arbery, as well as Breonna Taylor, uh, and just so many other names, even going back to Eric Gardner, like so many, so many people have been wrongly um, impacted by our judicial system, by our legal system, by our law enforcement system, and even left behind by our business community. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's put us in a place now where we have this awakening. Um, and, you know, we probably should have awakened a lot sooner than now, but we're here now. So the question is, what are we going to do now going forward? Yeah, no, that, um, yeah, that, that, that is a lot. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about some of my own personal experiences uh, that I'll be, some, some folks know I'll be sharing um, soon, but it, it does bring it home. And, um, I, you're right. Uh, you, you look at, uh, like I said, where we were um, a few years ago. I mean, we had what six Fortune 500 companies, right? Obviously, everybody's familiar with the uh, downward trajectory of Birmingham's uh, proper population. Um, and I don't think it's hyperbolic at all. If you look at what was coming out of the, um, I believe it was the Building Together report uh, about how 
many of our jobs are at risk of going away or being completely changed because of automation, uh, uh, AI and, and whatnot. And so um, it, it, it's a tale of two cities um, right now. Uh, for all the great things that are going on and, and all the signs of progress in Birmingham, we have to recognize that uh, for far too many people, that has not translated into economic success or any kind of success uh, for them as well. So I guess, so with that in mind, um, I'm almost, really, I'm compelled just to ask, like, how are you processing all of this? And, and how are you doing? How has this impacted you? Um, and what is it, while still being realistic, what is it that is encouraging or that is giving you you hope? Yeah. Um, yeah, these last several weeks have been tough. You know, you kind of alluded to it in your intro. Like, we are really facing three, at least three crises. Uh, you know, a whole health crisis, um, which some people feel like it's a hoax. Um, but I can tell you, being at UAB, we got, like, real people in the hospital that are on real ventilators that are really fighting for their lives. So... If you want to know whether this is a hoax or not, you know, pay attention to the numbers of hospitalizations and even the number of deaths that are happening here in Jefferson County, not just at UAB, but all across this county and all across the state and now even all across the Southeast. So we're in a real health crisis, which, uh, you know, we understand that it's leading to an economic crisis because we're having to shut down and shut down businesses and put in these ordinances. We had a curfew ordinance a couple of weeks ago. Now we have a mask ordinance. We have, you know, caps on the number of people that can gather. And so that's really impacting our economy. It's, it's impacting our small business owners, even some of our large uh, business owners. Um, and that's tough. And I don't think that we've actually seen the true impacts of this. We probably won't see it until fourth quarter of this year or maybe first quarter of 2021. You know, economists have have uh, confirmed that we are officially in a in a uh, in a recession. That hasn't gotten a lot of play yet, I think, in the media. But we need to pay really close attention to it because we've all seen some of the places that we all know and love that we spend time at, the the Urban Standards and the Bobaloos and all these other restaurants around town. Like they closed doors. There's going to be a lot of companies that are going to have to file bankruptcy, which means that's a lot of people that are unemployed. Um, and then when you're unemployed, typically that impacts your ability to have health insurance, which exacerbates the underlying health crisis that we already have. Um, and then both of those things have an adverse impact on communities of color, uh, typically because we are more likely to have these underlying health conditions. We are more likely to be in essential roles. And we just have greater exposure because of the, the, the jobs that oftentimes we, a lot of people in our community have to take on. And so because of that, in a city that's 75% African American, uh, black people in this in this community, and as well as our Latinx community, we are getting hit really, really hard. Um, and I don't know how that's going to pan out going forward when we get into 2021. I mean, time will only tell. And you know, people are talking about we're entering the second wave of the virus, but we never left the first wave. Like. <laughs> Right. Like really need to be it's still number one. Right. <laughs> we just came out of Fourth of July weekend. Like people were kicking it Fourth of July. People were hugging and kissing and barbecuing and just right. having all kinds of going to the beach. All I'm right. telling you. But seven, seven to ten days from now, you're probably gonna see another spike in hospitalization. So those are people who are your kids' teachers. Those are people who run the business in your community. You know, those are the people who are being impacted. And um, you know, so as we enter this new school, uh, school semester, you know, I have two kids, they're in the fifth and seventh grade. You know, I have to, my wife and I have to make some really tough decisions as to whether we're gonna send our kids back to school in the fall. Because, you know, people say, well, you know, your kids are gonna be fine. You know, it doesn't have impacts on people who are, you know, under a certain age. But I'm also thinking about those teachers. I'm thinking about those teachers that don't have the ability to work from home if you're a fifth grade teacher or your third grade teacher, and those kids want to come and hug you and say, hey, Ms. Johnson, how you doing? And, and that person has a compromised immune system. Like, when I think about those people, um, I, I, I just worry for our community. Going and I just don't know how we unpack that. But then the, the flip side of that is our schools are one of the biggest forms of childcare that we have for the people who need to go back to work. So how do you balance that out? Like, 
if I need to go back to work, but I need to keep my kids home, then what happens? Or do I have to send my kids to live with my parents? And so now you have these two, three generations that are engaging. And, you know, our seniors, they're in a place where typically they're going to have more pronounced uh, health conditions. And so bringing your fourth grader to go stay with your grandmother who is 78, that's just a bad recipe. And so there, there are no real easy solutions to this. And I think all of this has an impact on the health and vitality of our communities and our economy. So, um, so thanks for painting that rosy picture. <laughs> but it's real, it's, it's, it's real talk, it's real talk. Uh, it, and I will say Atlanta was wilding out. Um, I saw a video of, they put a pool in a club. Um, so Atlanta's on a whole nother level, but- um, Have you seen Mobile? I have not. Is have, it? Have you seen Destiny? Have you seen any of the? Have you seen Oak Mountain? <laughs> I use is is bad. Okay. <laughs> no city has cornered the market on people ignoring social distancing. <laughs> I guess that's encouraging to know. Birmingham's not alone. <laughs> so so let me so let me ask you this right. Um, all of these companies are coming out, making these statements. Um, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna do all of these great things. And, and I'm sure it's appreciated. Is it just lip service? And if, if not, how do, how do we actually put that into practice? And, and, and a wrinkle I add to that, um, what can we start to do on an individual level as well? Like what, is, what, is, what just, what does that look like? Because I'm thinking about mental health, right? Uh, I, I was talking to um, one of my uh, tech association counterparts and, and he was trying to reach out to um, a, a black woman who is doing a lot in the tech space for just some guidance and thoughts. Yeah, he wants to make sure that his organization is leaning in and, and, you know, he was, uh, just, you know, sharing with me, he was like, she's not calling me back. She's not, so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, she has a lot going on right now. This is a super traumatic experience. She probably still has to show up, still put a smile on her face, do all of these things while somehow compartmentalizing and suppressing. So, so that's what I mean, like on an individual level, what, what are some of the things that we could be doing? And then from a policy standpoint, what can some of the executives and the decision makers put into place that appreciates that? Like how, just help us make sense of all of that. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. So the first question was, you know, is it just lip service? You know, any company worth is waiting and, you know, whatever the analogy is, you know, every company issued some type of statement affirming their support of their black employees, their black customers, the, the black people in their communities, um, which is great. Now, the question is, are they going to follow those statements with action? You know, only time will tell. Um, but they are on the record. Um, and I think we're in a place right now where people are really going to hold these executives and these companies accountable. So I think the question is, what does that accountability look like? And uh, I think it's exciting what happened here in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago, where uh, Mayor Woodfin and a collection of leaders, um, I forget the name of the program, it's called Vital Valuing Inclusion and Transparency to Accelerate Lift or something like that. I'm probably butchering uh, the acronym. <laughs> better, better than what I was about to say. <laughs> You know, so, so, so essentially this is a commitment on behalf of that initial set of leaders, but they were encouraging other leaders to also join in and just be transparent about their spend. Like how much money are you actually spending, you know, with suppliers and then break that down by demographics, race, gender, and everything else. And make that publicly available and hopefully issue that on an annual basis. Um, and I think for a lot of companies, it's going to be very clear that they have opportunities to do better in their supply chains, in their procurement processes, who they actually spend money with. Do they spend money with women? Do they spend most of their money here locally in Birmingham or just go outside of Birmingham? And do people of color get those countries? And so I, I think that's going to be very helpful. Now, the follow-up is, what are you going to do about that? 
So for the last, what, five to seven years, uh, most of the tech companies in Silicon Valley have been doing the same. They've been issuing their annual reports. And the numbers have been abysmal. And they said, we're going to do better. And year after year, they don't do better. And in some cases, they do worse. Um, and that's not what is hardening because you have companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Uber, PayPal. Like, these companies employ some of the smartest people in the entire world. Or the whole earth, Craig. <laughs> they have some of the smartest people in the world, and they can't figure they can't out figure how to get more out. women in leadership. Right. How, how is that? Right. Yet, yet you can figure out how to you know, um, build a platform with billions of people on it. You can figure out how to build a platform that delivers products to your door by drones in 98 seconds. Like we can figure all those things out, but we can't right. figure out how to hire more women into the organization or how to get more black people on your board of directors. So I think for a lot of people, they don't have a lot of confidence in these, these statements because it's like, you just need to make the decision. Like if this is a priority, you will make it happen. You know, I, I, I've been having some tough conversations with my colleagues who are executives and leaders. And I, I just had to tell them, your HR people are bad at their jobs. Nobody wants to tell you this, but they're just not good at it. And, and let me tell you why I say that. If you have people who are in sales that work for you, and you give them a sales target, and they miss that target by 65%, what do you do? Now, if you're... If you're generous, you put them on a professional development plan, you get them the assistance they need in order to correct their performance, and then hopefully you give them a chance to do better. If after that they don't do better, then maybe you need to assign them to another role either within your company or you help them find employment somewhere else. And you put somebody in that position that's actually gonna hit the goal. However, when it comes down to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are so quick to give people participation trophies. And we tell our HR people, we tell our recruiters, we need to get more women and more minorities, people of color, into the organization, go out and make it happen. And then they come back and be like, yeah, I know the three finalists for this job are all white men, but you know, we tried to find some women, we tried to find some people of color, we just couldn't do it. And then the executives say, well, I'm sorry that you couldn't do it. Good job, pat on the back, do better next time. And then we keep punting down the field. And it, it, so I don't understand why in our sales roles, in finance, in technology, in marketing, in advertisement, you know, failure is not an option. Yet when it comes down to diversifying the people who come into our organization or diversifying the pipeline of people who can move into middle management and executive roles, when it comes down to putting people, uh, minorities, you know, whether it's women or people of color on our board of directors, it's just so hard. And then they reach out to me and you and be like, Dion, you know black people, right? Can you help me get some black people into my organization? <laughs> right. But they don't want to offer you any compensation for that. So it's like, right. I, but you got a whole HR staff. Who, who are these people and what do they do every day? So I think that's the place that we're in right now where people are like, if you wanted this to happen, it would have happened a long time ago. So until you actually show me some progress, no, I don't believe it. You know, I, I moderated a panel with uh, featuring a lot of different leaders, Mike Kemp and Selena Rogers Dickerson and, um, and Sanjay Singh last week and, um, and, and Meredith as well. And, and so Sanjay made a, a statement about Pac Hill. You know, he's on the board of Pac, Pac Hill and he said, we just decided that we were going to be diverse and we just built a diverse organization. And I can show you my stats. It was a decision. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission. They didn't have to go to any shareholders or stakeholders. They just said, this will happen, make it so. And it happened. So I think for a lot of people, they're saying, maybe, maybe these organizations either don't have the courage to make it happen, or they actually just don't have the ability or the capacity to do it. Right. And right. neither one of those are promising situations to be in. Yeah, no. Um... I, before I forget, so uh, Matt Hoddle, um, who is, um, of course, Red Hawk and uh, Alabama Futures Fund and um, board member of Tech Birmingham, he just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, tossed in the chat, Junko.com. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with, with Junko, uh, guys, I definitely, uh, I, I, I sound like a doggone as seen on TV commercial. <laughs> Tired of failed diversity practices? <laughs> I joke, but no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Uh, no, no, Elite Rise is, uh, she's, she's been out a great platform that actually um, uh, solves for a lot of the challenges that you just, just highlighted. So, uh, and if, if anybody watches this later, it's uh, J-O-O-N-K-O. Uh, but she's doing great work and in, in, in moving the needle on uh, those diversity issues and uh, making sure that companies have act. It removes the excuse that companies don't have access to diverse talent pools. So, uh, and if I butcher that, Hano, please, please uh, chime into the comments so I can uh, lift up a more appropriate description. Perfect. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank so, you. So, so here's the thing. Let's unpack that. Now. Yeah. The simple fact that you made the statement of if you don't know who Junko is. Yeah. Here's the thing. Everybody should know who Junko is. And every company in the city of Birmingham needs to be using Junko. Why wouldn't you be using Junko? If you say that diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to you, then you would actually seek out companies that are helping you solve that problem. So it should be a household name. Junko should be getting a contract. And particularly, so let me, let me get on my soapbox a little bit. I mean, <laughs> get on it. Now we're here. <laughs> Um, we have so many startup companies here in the city of Birmingham, and we have so many of our leaders in Birmingham say, yeah, we love the startup community. We support our tech startups. And we have all these pitch competitions. People may get 10 grand here for their startup, 50 grand, 100 grand, which is great. Some people even raise a million dollars for their startup. There are too many startups in this country. If you ask them, how many contracts do you have with large organizations in Birmingham? And they'll say, zero. So we can't say that we really support diversity, equity, and inclusion in our small business ecosystem or in our tech ecosystem, and we don't give people contracts. I mean, you just imagine, imagine how huge it would be for Junco to land a contract with a Regions, and maybe they have a contract with Regions, with the Regions, with a Protective Life, with an Alabama Power. Those things open doors to everybody else. Because these are some of the largest companies in the region, in, in the, the country, even in the world. And so having those contracts opens the doors to so many other contracts. So they don't even need to raise any more money because I got enough contracts that allow me to get to scale and grow my company. So we're going to have to be a lot more intentional about how do we unpack our supply chain, the barriers in our supply chains that prevent our tech startups from actually getting contracts with the company right here in our backyard right what a do you have a sense of what some of those barriers are is it just laziness is it institutional momentum is it just we have to come come together as a community and map out what that looks like or d all of the above i mean if if, if you have policies and practices in your organization such that it favors companies that have been around for three years that have three years worth of track record in sales and have this huge bonding capacity and have to have the ability to take on all of the work across your entire footprint of locations and thousands of employees, then no, the company that's only been around for 13 months may not be able to compete uh, for that. But that company may be running out of runway. And so I don't have another you know, 18 months in order to get to the place where I can take on that kind of contract so we're going to have to think a lot more creatively and innovatively as to how we support the, the, the businesses in our community. And that is going to require buzzword innovation. We're going to have to actually eat our own dog food and be innovative in how we do contracting. We're going to have to be innovative in how we do hiring. We're going to have to be innovative in how we do talent development. And we're going to have to be innovative in how we onboard people to get into our C-suites and on our board of directors. And so you can't say you want innovation on one side, but then say, but oh, we have these institutional pressures that won't allow us to do it. You can't have it both ways. Right. Um, <clears throat> this might actually be worth another shout out. Um, uh, Hado, chime in um, if I butcher this one as well. Uh, but something you, you said about those new companies, uh, uh, one of the AFF portfolio companies is Teaming Pro. Uh, and 
uh, prepare for a terrible analogy. They're like the tender of government contracting. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Swipe left, swipe yeah, right. Yeah, swipe right. <laughs> so if you have the, the you know this 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 skill set as a company, but you might not have, uh, you, there might be a gap that prevents you from getting a large federal contract. It can connect the system can connect you with somebody else to fill in that gap. Basically, uh, I hope that is. Uh, I, I haven't seen. <laughs> Okay, it's a hundred percent correct. I thought Matt was crying. It's like, oh my god, it's terrible. <laughs> so, te teaming pro, uh, they're they're out of uh, Huntsville, just a few miles up. But yeah, so so like supporting platforms and companies like that, bringing people together. Um, on a on a personal level, uh, and feel and feel free to push this kind of. Kind of, kind of to the side. I don't want to interrupt the flow, but I'm thinking about like team dynamics. And I know you've done a lot of research and you've published a lot of uh, work in that space. What do we need to be considering? Like, how is this impacting team dynamics within organizations? And can any of that be appreciated and mitigated, um, mitigated through policies? Or is this just something that we're going to have to all work through together? Is this just too brand new right now and too raw? Well, I, you know, teams are important, but at the end of the day, I think it's all about culture. And a lot of organizations, you know, would like to feel like they have an inclusive culture, one that does support teaming. And a lot of organizations do have those cultures that do promote teamwork and collaboration across disciplinary silos and things like that. But there are a lot of organizations that when they think about diversity, they want to think about intellectual diversity. How do we bring people together from different disciplines to come up with something that's creative and novel, which is great. But that type of focus has to also be married with the focus on diversity around demographics, gender, sexual orientation, you know, things like that. Um, and so, you know, sometimes, I, you know, I talk to executives and they say, hey, you know, we love recruiting at ABC University. And in my mind, ABC University is not necessarily a bastion of diversity. Uh, I'm like, that's interesting. Why do you recruit there? Like, because I can get all the diverse talent I need in that one place. <laughs> well, tell me about this diversity that you're able to get at ABC University. Oh, I can get people from Texas and Florida and <laughs> North Dakota. And I'm like, huh. Okay, so that's how you see diversity. Right. Um, and I think we're gonna have to have some uncomfortable conversations with our executives and our leaders because, you know, that a lot of people have this mindset of, I'm, I'm colorblind, uh, I don't see color. Uh, and it sounds good until you realize how racist it is. Um, and I don't mince my words with that. Like colorblindness is an actual form of racism. You know, when I think about a board that is composed of it's a 10 member board, nine of them are men, and one of them is a female. How disingenuous would it be when that woman comes to you and say, hey, we need to get more females on this board. And they say, you know what, Rebecca, I just don't see your gender. I just see you as a person. I don't think we need to consider gender at all when we're thinking about the next people that's gonna come on this board. Mind you, 70% of our clients are women. That's the kind of stuff that's been going on for decades in our companies and nobody's been willing to challenge these mindsets. And so it's the same way when you look at a person of color. When a person of color says, hey, there's a problem here. We need to get more people of color in the organization. Well, Dion, you know what? I just don't see your color. I just see you as a human being. How disingenuous that is, particularly when we set up a system that has favored one category over another category. Right. Uh, so those are the kind of conversations that we need to have. And I think our executives are gonna to have to have those conversations with each other. They're gonna to have to challenge each other. Um, and not put so much of the onus on the women and the people of color in their organizations to teach them how to be better. You know, everybody's going to have to do their own work. Everybody's going to have to do their own homework. They're going to have to study. They're going to have to read. And they're going to have to get outside of their comfort zone. So going back to what you said earlier, one of the things that the way I've been coping with this, but this has been a very, you know, these have been some difficult weeks, I think, for me, as well as a lot of other people all across this country, really all across this globe. And so it's just been a lot to unpack, a lot to uh, handle. One of the ways I've coped with it is just really equipping myself to actually have the difficult conversations. Um, and the way I've been equipping myself is to actually read the scholarship of my colleagues 
who are actual experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I do some work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I do a lot of other things even outside of that. But I have some colleagues that are legitimately some of the top scholars in the world, and they are putting out stuff in academic journals, but they're also writing for Harvard Business Review and Bloomberg and everywhere else. They're on podcasts and on interviews. Everybody's going to have to do their own work, and they're going to have to consume uh, this scholarship that's coming out. So I've been sharing their work. I've been reading their work, I've been consuming their work, and just equipping me to have those difficult conversations around the data, the statistics, and the solutions as to how we're actually gonna make this happen. And so I've been sharing that with some of my colleagues who are in leadership positions that are in a position to actually make it happen. And so I've been sharing it with them, sharing it with their teams. Um, I've been willing to go and do workshops for organizations, as well as just making introductions between those people and the people who are actually doing that work. And so that's the kind of way, that's the way that I've been not only doing self-care for myself, but also, I guess, engaging in a form of activism and, and advocacy. Gotcha. And it won't surprise you that most of the people who are doing this work are black women. Uh, yeah. Black women yeah. have always saved us. They've always come to our rescue um, <laughs> and they're still doing it. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know if they're gonna be show notes uh, to, to what we're doing here, but happy to, include some of my notes in with the show notes wherever this video uh, ultimately resides. And I just want to encourage people to do the work, to do the work of finding out who the scholars are, but even beyond the scholars, who are the people who are actually doing the work of building diverse, equitable, and inclusive entrepreneurial tech-based ecosystems? I'm thinking about the people like the Jay Baileys and the Sherelle Dorsey and Aaron Sanders and you know, the folks at Collab Capital and Harlem Capital and Arlen Hamilton, like if you're in venture capital, if you are in tech entrepreneurship, if you are running programs and these people are not household names to you, you are not doing the work, you are not prepared, you are not equipped to build a diverse, equitable, and inclusive ecosystem. Somebody needs to say it, I'm saying it right now. If you don't know these people, if you're not engaging with these people to find out what they're doing in their respective areas, if you're not trying to bring them to Birmingham to actually have conversations, and by the way, pay them, pay them for their expertise. If you're not inviting them to come to Birmingham to help consult with us on how we're building a better ecosystem, you're not really prepared or serious about doing the work. That's, what is, that's what's gonna be needed. And we're gonna have to put some resources behind it. We're gonna have to make some multi-year, multi-million dollar commitments to really drive this ecosystem once and for all. Because like you said, we have the Building It Together report. We have Together We Prosper report. We got the Brookings Institution and the work they're doing. We got reports on top of reports on top of reports. I don't want to see another damn report. We got <laughs> right, the reports. Right. Let's just do the work. Right. Um, tell them how you really feel. <laughs> okay, let me see. <laughs> So, so, oh, uh, before I forget, uh, if anybody in the uh, uh, in attendance, if y'all have any questions, feel free to, to toss those in or any just um, uh, thoughts that you would like for us to, to kind of uh, pull on and, and tease out, uh, feel free to do that. We've got about, uh, about 15 more minutes, but um, uh, so what, all right, <laughs> kind of a two part. I was going to ask like, what gives you, what gives you hope? Uh, but like what is I, the the people who are people who got out in March in the midst of a whole global pandemic? A whole <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> a whole <laughs> ass pandemic. I'm just gonna say <laughs> a whole ass pandemic. <laughs> Folks got out. They marched, mostly peaceful protests. Even the people that weren't peaceful. I mean, the way I look at it, until you disrupt commerce, nobody really pays attention to it. I'm gonna say yeah, that again. Yeah. Yeah, that was say working it, price of admission, and you didn't pay nothing for this. <laughs> but until you disrupt commerce, nobody pays attention and nobody's motivated to actually make something happen. Dr. King and the folks in the civil rights movement, they taught us that when they disrupted commerce with the, the bus boycotts. You know, when you think about people like Frederick Douglass and people like that, they had to disrupt commerce in order for people to actually pay attention. This pandemic, and the economic crisis that happened because of it disrupt commerce. The whole racial unrest, it disrupt commerce. And when you do that, people are like, oh, I get it now. We got to make something happen. So the real heroes are the people that actually got on those front lines and disrupted highways. They 
boycotted, they stood in the doors and didn't let people come to work. And when you do stuff like that, people are willing to come to the table. And I think we're going to have to do a lot more of that if we really want to make a change. It should not have to come down to that, but that's what it's going to have to come down to. Yeah, no, no, uh, you, 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 you're spot on with that. I was actually just kind of revisiting some um, uh, some materials around um, the Children's Crusade and, and um, you know, Birmingham March, and, and that was it, right? You had to disrupt it because they came off of that failed campaign in Albany where they tried a different tactic. And it didn't work, you, and you have you have to strike at the heart of commerce. So, um, so with that in mind, actually, so what, what is what is Birmingham's unique role in all of this? How how do we position ourselves uh, as as leaders in this space and, and draw on the lessons and the legacy um, in the '60s? There are very few cities in this country that are getting it right as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are very few corporations and companies that are getting it right. So to me, that is an opportunity. It's a problem, but it's also an opportunity. And I know we're planting our flags in a lot of different places in our community around tech entrepreneurship, biotech, uh, precision medicine, advanced manufacturing with our automobile um, uh, uh, places, uh, industries. But at the end of the day, nobody's really owning this space around driving inclusive economic growth. I think Birmingham has an opportunity to do that. We need some whole tech incubators and accelerators where people, that's all they do is work on startups like Junco. Why don't we have an accelerator that's just focused on how do we help the banking industry develop uh, a much more diverse, equitable, and inclusive ecosystem? And do it in a way where it's profitable. Like, again, nobody's owning that space. We could own that as, as a city uh, because we have the moral authority and platform to do so because what happened in Birmingham in the 60s changed the world. We did it then, we could do it, we can do it again. Uh, we just gotta make a decision. Again, I go back to what Sanjay said, when they did a pac L. they just decided and they just made it so. So if we want it to happen, we just gotta make a decision and then just do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, man, brother, I, I appreciate you. What, <laughs> I, I, I wanna make sure I'm giving you a space. What, what in any of this, have I missed or, or do we need to just go back and, and pull on and make sure that it, it, it resonates? Um, I think when you look at, again, we, we have a city that's 75% African American. You know, I, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been encouraged by the number of people who have reached out to me to say, hey, can we talk? And in a place where we've created psychological safety, vulnerability where people can be their authentic selves and say, I really don't know much about diversity, equity, inclusion. Can we talk about it? And that has been encouraging me. But then also through those conversations, what I realized is that a lot of people have no idea who Urban Impact is. Um, you know, one of our economic development agencies that is focused on building and supporting our African-American uh, ecosystem. I'm surprised by the number of companies that are not donating money to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. The people who don't know what's going on in the Civil Rights District around the redevelopment of the Prince Hall Masonic Temple. The people who really don't know a lot about A.G. Gaston. People don't know about how we're connecting the Civil Rights District with the Innovation District. Everybody knows about Innovation Depot, but very few people know about these other agencies that are actually doing the work. Operation Hope to the World, and Hope Credit Union, work that Kendra Key is doing, or you know, the Penny, uh, Penny Foundation Bank that Lord Watson is doing. So if, if, again, if these are not household names to you, these organizations and these people, you're not actually doing the work. And yeah. so I'm encouraging people to actually do the work. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're in a place right now where people are gonna reach out to those agencies, those people, the urban leagues of the world, and actually have the conversations. And not just the conversations, but also want to contribute resources to them. To me, I think it's somewhat shameful in this community that the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute is, a not, is not the most well-funded agency in the city. I think that's shame on this community. So I look forward to the day where Civil Rights Institute, 16th Street Baptist Church, Urban League, Urban Impact, NAACP, those are the most well-funded agencies in this city because they have been doing the work for decades on shoestring budgets. Whereas when I look at other organizations, they are 
flush with cash. They are flush with staff. They have multiple grant writers on staff. Uh, and it's just hard to compete with that. And so, for some reason in this community, we've been okay with that. Um, so I think we need, I need, I think we need to bolster those institutions. And I think we need to actually finally give them the budgets and the resources through which they can actually fulfill their mission of building a better Birmingham and particularly building a better inclusive Birmingham that, in, that really includes people of color as well as women and people of different uh, sexual orientation and people of different abilities. Once we do that, I think Birmingham is gonna be poised to be the city we know that it can be. If we're not willing to do that, my kids are 10 to 12 years old. I'm pretty sure that they're not going to want to be in Birmingham after they go off to college. They're not going to come back. And that saddens me. But to be true, be told, me and my wife don't have to be here. Yeah. Deion Gordon doesn't have to be here. Natalie Kelly doesn't have to be here. Ed Fields doesn't have to be here. Carmen Mays doesn't have to be here. None of these people, none of us have to be here. And if we don't make substantive changes, I think a lot of us will leave. And we don't say that enough because we're such ambassadors for Birmingham. But let's be clear. There are going to be some winners and losers that are come, going, to, going to come out the other side of these, this triple crisis that we're having right now. There are communities right now that are planting the flags. They are getting together. They're putting their resources together. And they're saying, we are going to be the top city for inclusion, diversity, and equity. And you're going to see a mass migration of people to those regions and to those communities. And keep in mind, we're just less than 20 years away from us being a majority minority country. So again, those communities that figure out diversity, equity, and inclusion are going to have a serious competitive advantage over those that don't. Mm -hmm. Birmingham has an opportunity to be in that number if we want to. If we don't want to, I don't know where Birmingham is going to be 20 years from. And those are the conversations we need to have. We haven't been having them, yeah. but we need to have them. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Um, man, I appreciate hey you. Hey, I was just about to, uh, to bring you in. We got, we got seven minutes and we got some questions. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to help tee some of these up. All right, so um, Anthony, and I see you mentioned Natalie, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we're in the best class ever of Leadership Birmingham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? Right in front of me? Okay. Oh, yeah, you know it. Um, so Brenda, as you talked about PAC Health. Um, Brenda also asked about showing examples of other companies and what they're doing to get it right. Um, well, I think, first of all, you have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of what happens inside of organizations is driven by the board of directors. And I think if the board of directors has the heart and the capacity for the organization to be diverse, it will be diverse. If it's not going to be diverse, you fire the CEO and you get another CEO. I mean, it's, it's really just that simple. I, I don't know why we try to complicate it. You either get the job done or you don't get the job done. Um, very simply, you have to build relationships with uh, organizations that are women-focused student, women student clubs, African-American student clubs. You just can't show up at, on one day and say, I'm going to sit up a table and do a career fair. You actually have to build relationships. Mm -hmm. So I think ground zero for a lot of the diversity, equity, inclusion efforts has to be at our colleges. If people are not exposed and trained how to build diverse, equitable, and inclusive organizations when they're in college, particularly in our business schools, how do you expect them to do that when they actually go out and get a job? So I think the organizations that are getting it right are sitting on the advisory councils of the tech programs, the human resources programs at the colleges where they recruit. They are going to HBCUs. They are partnering with organizations like En-ROADS and all the other organizations that are focused on minority and, uh, and women empowerment. They're building relations with them and now they get first dibs at Top Salary. Thank you. Um, I do, you know, I see this going on and you know that a lot of the stuff that I do, you know, it starts with intentionality. Um, and I do that with the speaker things. And we, you know, we made that commitment early on in two of the organizations that I work with speakers. So, you know, it's easy. It's not difficult to be intentional about these things. 
And that kind of leads into uh, something that Melanie had a comment and then she had another question. Um, the comment is that a lot of recruiters and HR folks are doing a good job to bring the diversity and then we're not, you know, as much as we educate the HR and recruiters, we're not putting that up the pipeline to the hiring managers. So it's not just HR, it's the hiring managers and pushing that forward. Um, and to that end, she would also be interested in your thoughts on this new trend of chief DNI officers. So does that mean it's a CDIO now? Um, and what, what do you think about this? Will it make a difference? I, can't, I think it can make a difference if it's not just a title. And I think a lot of companies are having a knee-jerk reaction. Um, they find the most prominent uh, black person in their company. Most of the time it's, it's a black person. They find the most prominent person in the company. Uh, and bonus points if that person is uh, not heterosexual. Um, and so if I can check a whole bunch of boxes, then I put that person in a role. I pay them. I give them a bump in salary. Sometimes I, that person still has to do their previous job. And then this is just a role on top of the job that they were already doing, but they don't give them a budget. They don't give them a staff and they don't actually build a division or an office for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if you're doing that, all you're doing is you're really just trying to buy, buy yourself some time and some goodwill in the community and you're kicking the can down the road. So just by announcing somebody as a chief diversity officer, that's not going to drive systemic change in the organization. So you added a little, you had a word in there and I personally find it interesting and that a lot of people are diversity inclusion, diversity and inclusion, and you added the word equity. Why is the equity just as important? as the DNI. Well, let's be clear. So diversity is about looking at oftentimes categorical dif differences in people that you're bringing in. What percentage of men, women, people of different orientation and, and color. Okay, so that's diversity. Inclusion is once you get them into the organization, do you have a culture through which people can be their authentic selves and actually can raise up in the ranks and feel welcomed and stuff like that. That's inclusion. Equity is are opportunities equally divided and are they just within the organization? So most of our organizations, and we know this, they pay men more than women. That is not yeah. equitable. Uh, when you look at their leadership ranks, there are more men than there are women. That's not equity. So there are a lot of times, the reason why people can't bring in diverse talent to the organizations is because they're not inclusive. And so we talk. And so when that person of color comes to me or that woman comes to you and say, hey, what do you think about me working that organization? You're like, don't go there. Stay away from there at all costs because mm -hmm. they will chew you up and spit you out. These are the conversations that women and people of color have. We tell people, stay away from these organizations. Yeah. And so when the HR person goes out there, they're like, well, I just can't get people to apply for the job. Like, yeah, because you have a toxic work environment. Nobody wants to work for you. So if you want to be effective in your diversity recruitment, diversity efforts, you're going to have to first start with inclusion and culture in the organization. And then you're also going to have to make sure that you're paying people equitably and giving them equitable opportunities to rise up in the organization. If you don't do that, the best of diversity efforts are going to fail. I agree. I'm glad we, we uh, got that in there. So we have a minute left. We have two people who've raised their hands. Um, Jared and Gracia, um, if you can throw your questions in the Q&A real quick, and then we will get to you. And then um, we understand if you've got to pop off because it is one o'clock. We try and be respectful of everybody's time. I too am I gonna ha am going to have to pop off for a meeting shortly, which by the way is for some of Tech Birmingham's own diversity and inclusion initiatives. We are working with different communities within the tech community um, to develop some affinity groups. So I actually have one of those meetings right after this today. So we're really excited Super to excited. announce that kind of stuff coming up really soon. Um, we also um, are doing our best to keep these conversations going. Um, one of those ways is we're partnering with Birmingham Black Techies and Rua Benjamin's Race After Technology. Have you seen or heard of her, Anthony? I don't think so. Okay, so she spoke at the NCWIT, the National Women in Technology Organization, about race after technology. So NCWIT, who we partner with, mm -hmm. has given us permission to have a watch party of her discussion 
And so we're going to do that in a couple of weeks with Birmingham Black Techies. And then we're going to do a book read and then come back and discuss the book together as well. And you know me in books. I mean, you know, no, <laughs> there's, there's no surprise that I'm going to read another book. Um, so we're really excited about those things. And I don't see any more questions. All right. So, so bef um, before you wrap us up, um, Anthony, uh, where can folks find you? Uh, they can find me everywhere at Anthony C. Hood. Uh, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn. Uh, I need to get my Twitter game up because it is uh, <laughs> um, But I usually post maybe three or four times a day on LinkedIn, and I'm sharing a lot of those things I mentioned earlier about the, the scholars who are actually doing the DE&I work as well as the people, the practitioners that are actually out here on the front lines building diverse, equitable, and inclusive entrepreneurial and tech ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, oh, I also want to uh, lift up, uh, you had mentioned having those tough conversations, uh, T. Marie King. Yeah. Uh, at tmarieking.com, if you got to have uh, tough conversations, if you want to know how to build those cultures uh, that, that Dr. Hood was talking about, you ha I cannot speak highly enough about this sister. Uh, T. Marie is just absolutely phenomenal. So, yes, so please yes. seek her out. Uh, and, and I'll have, uh, I got Carmen, to- Carmen Mays at Elevators. Oh, they're yes, doing, they're doing yes. They're amazing work and they're partnering with some national organizations. So they're doing some really Absolutely. Uh, so so to, two quick questions. We're over. Two quick questions, uh, lightning round, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. Is the west side the best side? Uh, <laughs> is the best side. Hey, man, for those tutors out there, you know I've got that degree in preservation, and I'm just like, please keep posting more pictures for me. <laughs> All right, final question. Uh, favorite Andre 3000 verse or Outcast song? Uh, Liberation. Featuring uh, Erica Badu and CeeLo. Can't go wrong with that one. Man, yeah, classic. All right, brother. Uh, well, well, Rebecca, did you want to uh, wrap us up since you, you popped in? It's, it's good to see your face. Uh, you yeah, take us I'm, out? I'm usually not um, in front of the camera during these so i just want to thank everybody for being here you know i'm the director of membership and special events for tech birmingham so if you are not a member please join we've got all kinds of really great stuff coming up we are keeping a full calendar uh, we are online every week doing something different and bringing you amazing conversations like this and to be honest with you how this came about was because i was scrolling through LinkedIn and I saw a post that Anthony had made and I was like that's the perfect thing and so I was like hey man do you want to do this and I'm so thankful that you did so thank you so much for joining us well, thank you for inviting me I appreciate you and um we will see you all at the next navigating and if you haven't uh come to breakfast club and you want to get up early and join us at 8 a.m on Thursdays we have a little nerdy social hour um on uh, Zoom to show us your mug and uh, join in some fellowship and, you know, hanging out a little bit. So other than that, thanks again, everybody for coming along.